Hello and welcome once again to Clash Course. Um, this show is going to be better than most of them because Craig is not here. Um, and in his stead, uh, we have uh, Christopher Mowdy who's going to try and fill in his shoes. Um, how are you doing, Christopher? I'm doing quite well. And how about yourself, Joey? Oh, I'm not too bad. Uh, we decided uh, this week that we would uh, do a little experiment um, and, uh, and start with a light topic. Um, Christopher has seen some of the past shows, um, and, and he saw what I'm capable of, uh, and he said, please, please, can we start start light? Right, Christopher? Those are my exact words. Huh. Thank you. Thank you. And inflection. Wow. I'm working, on my, I'm working on my impression of you. I was going to say, that was a dead-on Chris Mowdy. You thought you were here. I thought I was talking to me. Wow. That's strange. Um Okay, so the first topic that we were going to uh, to play around with, um, once again, uh, starting light here, and just to see how it goes, um, and uh, and we may do it again if it works well. Um, you know, in the past few, in the past shows since Clash Course has begun, we've talked about heavy theological topics. Today, we are going to begin with the subject of music for the masses. Christopher, can you explain a little bit about what your intention was when you came up with this with this topic? Okay, so <clears throat> um, I'm a, a trained musician, as uh, I think many uh, of the people who are involved with the New Covenant group, as well as a bunch of my friends, obviously, because I'm a musician, I have musician friends, are. Um, I went to school for music, I have a certificate in music performance, and so I hold dear this craft of music. And... Um, there is a part of me that's a little bit concerned with the free distribution and use of software and applications such as GarageBand and things like that, where people can just, who have no training or talent or anything of the sort, can throw together songs that, for all intents and purposes, sound radio ready or good enough. Um, by anyone else's criteria to be played on the radio and things like that. So um, a, a part of me laments that, and I was curious to know what your thoughts were on it. Do you sit in sackcloth and ashes when you think about the subject? Uh, actually, I'm crying uh, as I think about it. I, I, I get very upset about it, and uh, especially when I think about the young noobs that are out there like rocking garage band probably twice as well as I am uh, because I'm actually playing each individual track instead of, you know, going to a, a loop library. Gotcha. So, well, you uh, when you brought this topic up, I was very interested to, to discuss it with you, particularly since you kind of uh, put your arm around me and said, hey, buddy, us trained musicians, uh, we don't like this uh, this garage band stuff. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, um, you know, it might interest you to know that I use garage band all the time. GarageBand is my main DAW. I, I, I'll admit that. Is it? I'll admit that. Yes. Yeah. So I think we need to uh, we need to we need to to specify, you know, that uh, well you you brought up the topic of loops that uh, you know mm -hmm. somebody just slaps loops in and, and GarageBand has a big loop library. Mm -hmm. um, so does uh, so does Logic. So so my workflow goes like this. And by the way, I, I'm not a trained musician either. I mean, I I, I have some vocal training. Uh, but mm -hmm. I don't know how to play a single instrument. Um, I just hear things in my head. Uh, but besi you play, besides you're voices. a songwriter, right? I hear th yes, I hear songs in my head, and then I and then I write them down. And okay. how long have you been so writing songs? Uh, since I was a kid. Okay, so so you've honed the craft of songwriting, whether or not you're a trained. Like I would be more. I would be less of a. I would be a technician compared to the craft that you had honed. My craft would be to facilitate the craft that you had honed. Yeah. But anyway, that's that's a little bit of a digression. By the way, how how do you what's your position on laying down instrumental tracks to theistic songs? To theistic songs? Yeah. Um uh, I've always explained my I have this particular dilemma. I am a, an Italian American um uh white dude trying to facilitate his favorite music, which happens to be born out of Baptist churches, which is R&B funk. So, oh, nice. and I'm an atheist. It's quite a conundrum. At that. It's, it's, it's a heck of a conundrum because my favorite music, 
um, from an atheist's perspective, I should never be able to attain because it should be the spirit of the Lord that drives how funky and rhythm and soul filled you are in the rhythm and soul style of music that I pursue. But so um, so it should be Jesus that 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 makes you funky. Uh, but it is uh, if, for you, theists that are funky, they should be claiming that. But you find alternative methods of funkiness. I, I'm I'm pursuing <laughs> in my laboratory. I have discovered many alternate methods towards funkdom, and I, wow. I, I have I have the techniques and the technology, but it's the feel. Maybe we should Most... change our slogan to uh, New Covenant Group: Atheists and Theists are funky. That if you made T-shirts like that, I think that I would uh, I would tow the bill. For the uh, for the T-shirts, if they actually said that, done. And I'm I'm not I'm actually not holding myself to uh, following through with that commitment. Oh well, that's but it that's a loophole. But it's, that's a loophole. It sounded good. It did. It sounded good at the moment. It did. <laughs> okay. And that's just to reinforce the fact that I want T-shirts that say that. Right. So you were hoping mm -hmm. to trick me into printing those T-shirts and then backing out of the deal. Just one. I mean, because you would need one as a sampler, right? And I would just be like, hey, get it in a lodge and send it to blah, 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 Philadelphia. Gotcha. And then I would be like, nah, you shouldn't mass produce this. This yeah. one that I have is perfect. So just getting back to the topic, my, uh, my workflow uh, in music <laughs> starts with an iPhone um, or, or an iPad. Uh, okay. I hear things, um, I hear little ditties little tunes, and I will uh, record them with my voice using a, a, a looper. Uh, not, mm -hmm. not loops, but a looper. Uh, I, will, I will record harmonies and etc. And then I'll, throw, I'll, I'll put them in my journal. Uh, and I have years of stuff like that. And then, you know, if something seems like there, you know, it might be worth my time to spend a little more time in, I'll move it over to GarageBand on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, I have a condenser mic that can go into uh, the iPhone or the iPad or my Mac. And so I'll plug it in, get some clean sounds, um, lay down some instrument tracks. And I don't play, the. sadly, this is where it really falls short. This is where I need the help of, a, of talented atheists to help me with my theistic songs. Um, I, I can't play an instrument, so I have to move little squares around on a grid. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and come up with the sounds that I, that, that I, that I kind of want. And they and they they kind of come out okay. Mm. And is that where you end, or do you take that no, as no. a pre-production idea that then goes towards production, where you do use? Once it gets too frustrating to work in on the iPhone, I I move it to GarageBand on my Mac, mm -hmm. and uh, I work on it some more. And eventually, it'll get too complicated there, and then I'll import it into Logic, and mm -hmm. I'll I'll spend a year finishing it up. And still not have any live instruments on it? Uh, no, all digital instruments. Yeah, yeah, because mm. because no one will help me. <laughs> all of, all of, all of the best musicians are atheists. Yeah. Well, I think that that that's a different problem. Yeah. Um, but I think that you're but you're utilizing the technology as a scratch pad, which I think is fantastic. As far as pre-production goes, I think that the technology that I'm talking about is a wonderful facilitator of getting ideas down. But I guess what I'm talking about are people that use the pre-production tools and just kind of end there, like like the whole phenomenon of people that. Um, like bands that have whole CDs that are produced in GarageBand. Well, you know what? Instead of doing that, why not get Logic? Because God, GarageBand is like the pedestrian version of Logic, as I understand it. I'm not a Logic user, but um, and I might be. I'm a little naive as far as all the digital um, audio workstations, but I think GarageBand is like the, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean they they bear some version of a uh, logic. They bear some subtle similarities, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean GarageBand is is you know awesome for you know just just getting started, uh, but you don't want to finish up a song there. But what what negative effects do you feel that it has for somebody who just wants to stay in GarageBand? Why do you think it's it's negative for them to to just stay there? I don't think that it's necessarily negative. I just think that it's um. It's people. Um, let's see. Logic, I guess my logic issue, used to cost my issue, my, where the rubber hits the road is um, where ease of use 
get, uh, becomes a crutch for people who lack talent. You know okay. what I mean? Like for, for songwriters and for people who have ideas that use it as a scratch pad, I think that it that it that the, um, the, the technology facilitates it very well. You but know, this, I, I this, also, uh, the argument that you're making reminds me of the argument against software piracy. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not in favor of stealing, but mm -hmm. uh, but it can be said that many people who who fund uh, companies like a, like Adobe uh, and uh, and Apple um, started their career by pirating their software, and they wouldn't have a career if they weren't able to do that because this software that, that software costs hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars sometimes. Mm -hmm. And now you know because they were able to experiment with the software um, and learn it. Now they 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 fund the companies because they're able to do it professionally. Um, and, uh, but, but that's not the part of the argument that, that I'm talking about. The part of the argument that I'm talking about is where, um, m you know, the music industry or the software industry, whoever says, well, they are, we are losing sales because these people who are getting our software for free, if we stopped piracy, they would have to buy it. And so we're losing sales, but, but that is, I see this, that is going. only true in a very small way because most of the people who are pirating would not buy that software. Mm -hmm. So you're saying because GarageBand is free, why not utilize it to the nth degree? And, 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 it, and it opens the door to music to many people who never even thought about becoming musicians because they never found in life the, the, the motivation to work that hard. And so it's kind of like a, like a, like a, like a, like an easy, yes, it is easy, but it's an, it's an entry to kind of tempting you to want more. And, and yes, many people won't, but what about the people who do, who wouldn't, uh, who wouldn't have otherwise? Um, I'm happy for the people that do. I just think that um, there is a cohort of people that the ease of use for, in certain programs like GarageBand, um, allows them to label themselves as musicians a little prematurely. Sure. Um, and I think that for me, the litmus test is live performance. Sure. So yesterday, I had an opportunity to jam with a drummer and a guitar player for the first time in a long time, and um, it just reinforced the the idea in me that you know, like where true musicianship comes from. Just the idea that one of us could throw an idea out. And the other two could pick it up and we can make it 20, 30 minutes worth of improvised yet structured sound. Um, and it sounds good. And we were but, able to facilitate each other. And, you know, live and live performance is where it's at. OK, you're saying and, live performance is the litmus test. Well, what about what about live performing per, performers like Mika? I'm you not familiar Mika with is, who Mika is. Mika is a, is a brilliant musician, but most of what he does is pre-composed in you know a DAW or I mean it's 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 you know it's huge layers of instrumental mixes there are some live instrumentation but but most of what he does is not and, okay. and, and his so brilliance it's like playing comes, with a sequencer yeah his brilliance comes from creating these compositions that he hears in his head and he's got a great voice but uh but you know he's like me uh, he, you know, he could never, all the instruments that he's composing, or most of them, uh, he could never do live. You know, he, he has some live instruments uh, on, on stage, but a lot of it is, uh, is pre-composed, just, you know, playing off of a computer. See, for me, I would have to admit that that would, that may not be as interesting or entertaining um, as going to see people who where the the sound that you hear is generated from the analog live people um, playing it I can yeah I can agree with that uh, but but I can't uh, surely you can admit that there may be some other interesting uh, elements that they might get out of that besides just live performance I mean what about what about the gentleman's voice what about his uh, what about his hip thrusts? He has lots mm -hmm. of hip thrusts. Uh, uh, hip thrusts are important, right? And, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm as guilty of them as anybody else. Yeah. Um, but and 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 I also want to throw another dimension in a wrinkle in the in the conversation where I like really well produced studio songs for the sake of really well produced studio songs. Sure. Like I think that is its own thing. 
Um, so when that is combined with really well, um, really good performances, I think that it's mana from the heavens. Um, so, so I'm 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 a little bit torn, but you know, I I certainly appreciate the fact that the what you're talking about is certainly art. It's just not art that resonates with me. What about and Daft I guess Punk? The, what about Daft Punk? Yeah. Um, I I only know them from the one song that's popular on the radio yeah. right now. They have a huge following and a huge, I mean, huge crowds gathered to their live performance, and uh, and they they sit behind uh, computers and they and they play. The, the tracks that they've created prior they, they you know they do you know they do the the dj sort of thing i think that that is lame from a live performance perspective but i also have insight into daft punk which makes them more nuanced than the average dj if i'm correct and i might not be if i'm correct they created their own loops yes. with artists that um from the 70s so in other words instead of a lot of that, sampling, a lot of it, yes. Instead of sampling Nile Rodgers' guitar, they invited Nile Rodgers to the studio to play guitar to make loops that they could end up using in their songs. Yeah, well, they're huge, but they they weren't always like that. Mm -hmm. I think that that, you know, and, and maybe they only did that for this album. I think that is a brilliant conceptual thing to do. But to go to a concert to see two dudes behind a computer and maybe a singer... I would feel totally ripped off as a ticket buyer. Well, hundreds of thousands of people would disagree with you. Oh, popularity is not a litmus test for talent. Great statement. I like that. Um, so what about these uh, little 99-cent apps where people can, uh, you know, there's little objects that bounce off of each other and they make uh, um, uh, sounds off of the pentatonic uh, scale um, randomly? And then they uh, export not, it and they... I don't know if I'm familiar with those. Oh, there's tons of them. Do you have an iPhone? Yeah. Are you talking about straight-up games that happen to no. use pentatonic scales? Or are you talking about like music apps that... Yeah, pro progressive, uh, um, kind of physics-based uh, music systems that kind of create music based upon you just placing an object. Like a, I, I bought one a few years back that... You know, it has a pulse generator, and the pulse doesn't make any sound, but once it hits an object, it makes a sound. And so you put objects around it. Some objects are reflectors, and some objects are absorbers, and the objects can orbit each other. And, and you can create this crazy physical composition that mm -hmm. ends up making music. Well, that's pretty cool. But that kind of reminds me of, um, maybe I'm dating myself, but when I was a kid, we used to have um, a toy that was called the Sound Effects Machine. And it was a plastic box about this big that had a bunch of knobs and levers that allowed you to simulate the sound of people running and bombs, bombs dropping and stuff like that. And it sounds like what you're describing is a very... Um, technologically advanced musical version of that where you just get to experiment with things and yeah this just made musical to be tones music. yeah right mm -hmm. i um, mean I, but does has anybody used that to make an album's worth of music uh no but uh but people do use experiment you know software like that for experimental purposes they incorporate it with their with their songs etc and uh um i mean I think that that's irrelevant because you've, I mean, you've already talked about uh, bands who make entire albums in GarageBand. Who are these bands, by the way? They're like indie garage bands, you know what I mean? And which, you know, and, and we could talk about the music industry and how it's kind of falling apart, you know, aside from like the super huge acts and how easy it is to access independent music. But are but, they succeeding? Um, it depends on what you define as success, right? So in America, with the independent music world being the way that it is, if you can garner 50,000 fans across the nation to buy your album every two or three years that you put it out and to buy tickets when you tour, you can self-support yourself as an independent musician. I think that's great. I mean, so, I mean, is, is that, but uh, to get to your question, is that success? Um, you know, some people strive for that. Some no, I didn't say is that bigger. success. I said, are they succeeding? Are they succeeding? Sound, I mean, from what you tell me, it sounds like they, they are. I mean, if you can make a, a living, that's that's a version of success. Mm -hmm. And and 
you know, and I'm not an audiophile. So I'm probably one of those people that even if I a bead a studio album as compared to the garage band album, I probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference unless unless they like really misused compression and mic placement yeah. and stuff like that. So so in my opinion, there's room for both here, both uh, um, really talented live performance musicians and people who have very creative uh, musical ideas in their head, but but are not talented with instruments or or skilled with instruments enough to put it down in a live performance way. I, you know, I think it's great that uh, that these that, that people can just use GarageBand and they can take something that was in their head and amaze people with their ideas. Uh, this is that to me, this is no different than somebody writing a book. And, and impressing other people with their ideas. This is just a another form of, of writing where you're where you're showing somebody an idea and another person likes it. And if lots of people like it and they'll pay for the book or the track, I think that that's that that's wonderful. But at the same time, um, but if that's what it's being used for, you know what I mean? You're, you're talking about technology being used in an organic process. And what I'm arguing against is the organic process being thwarted by the fact that technology is the inspiration anymore. But how can these people succeed unless they are, con unless they are creating something original? I mean, but I guess we're, we're talking about two different people. Like I said, the people that are using it as in an organic process they're using it successfully and people that are you know um just putzing around on it no because because just because because you know 15 20 minutes ago you mm -hmm. were arguing against the use of garage band and in the middle of your argument you said you know True. there's these people that use garage band they put entire albums out and then i asked you are they succeeding mm -hmm. and you said well they're making a living and i said i think that's great because they're putting out ideas and now you're saying you're not talking about them you're talking about the people who who are just using it to putz around. I guess I am including them in the category because uh, ultimately, you know, uh, well, I guess I kind of, uh, no, 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 I get, you, you got me on that one because I thought that we kind of settled that in the fact that you were arguing earlier, but after I had made that original statement that, you know, um, the argument was not unlike the, the software piracy argument. And you had admitted that, um, garage band being free why not utilize it to its fullest and you know when you put it that way i i, I can see a charm in it you know um, i'm not trying i'm not a spokesperson for any digital audio workstation so i'm not trying to force people to buy a upgraded version of a daw sure. so um so I, I found that line of argument kind of convincing uh that if somebody were to utilize garage bands to its capacity um kudos to them um i mean you can assu take ass assuming of course that you know it it started with an organic process and they weren't just going in there and finding loops and being like that sounds cool let's write a song around that have you ever have you ever looked up uh garage band performances on youtube no i haven't there, there are people who take the ipad i saw this one amazing youtube video where somebody took the ipad and they pulled up the guitar uh, on the iPad, and they did this electric guitar performance. Now, I, I'm not talking about these guys. This is a totally separate, well, separate but related topic. I know we were talking about people who can't play, but I've mm -hmm. seen people who have taken this, you know, quote unquote toy, and and I saw this amazing uh, electric guitar solo done on the electric guitar simulator on the iPad. Really, it was incredible. I'd like to see that. Yeah, like, not, not because that. I disbelieve you, but just because I would like to see that. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty amazing. But it also, I mean, I've also seen. So let's let's pivot off of GarageBand, and um, but still stay on the topic a little bit. So I happen to, uh, and I'm going to send you a link after this. Um, so I recently got into a um, bass player that is a uh, young jazz fusion bass player, um, and I can't even pronounce his name, so I'm not even going to try. Um, but uh, he was playing at a clinic at the NAMM show, the NAMM show, the North American Music Merchandiser show. And um, he was playing with a drummer, and the drummer did not have a drum set. He was literally playing a pad of buttons. Yeah. And, and he was better than most drummers that I've played with. Yeah. So it kind of raised a lot of questions for me in 
what is an instrument? Um, because he was a player. There was no doubt that he was a player and that he was using technology. But it still made me feel weird to watch him interact <laughs> because they were playing like jazz fusion at the height of technical ability, at the fringes of up-tempo craziness. And this drummer was keeping up like, like yeah. he was typing in a, uh, like a stenographer. He has eight drumsticks instead of two. Well, uh, he, potentially he was killing ten. It. Yeah. So, how do you feel about that? The use of technology. I think it's capacity? amazing. Uh, it, it, you know, when I first, um, gosh, you're going to get me off on a real tangent here. When when I, when I first, uh, the first iPhone like device I bought was an iPod Touch, okay. and I bought it because, because I really wanted a great music player. I, I wanted to put my music on the iPod Touch and. I wanted to pull up CoverFlow, which is just like a like a simulator for it makes you know it makes your albums look like records and you can flip through them and okay. play music real quick. That's why I bought it. But mm-hmm. but once I bought it, um, I saw that all of these people were putting out these digital apps for the iPod Touch, um, art apps, which I'm an illustrator and uh, made me really really excited, and music apps uh, that GarageBand hadn't come out, but they were, they were putting out some pretty interesting music apps and it was an ex, it was one of the most exciting times in my life because you know as a as a child i wanted to learn to play the piano i wanted piano lessons my mom is a brilliant uh pianist um but uh she uh she got forced to learn the piano as a child in a sense she wanted mm-hmm. to but then she gave up but her grandma wouldn't let her give up um and so when i asked for piano piano lessons my mom had a reaction to that and decided that no i wasn't gonna have piano lessons i guess she didn't decide i guess she decided she didn't want me to go through what she went through but i really wanted them instead of and and instead of piano lessons she gave me karate lessons um okay which is similar you know similar but you know not quite the same piano karate um Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I got into karate for about a month and then decided it wasn't for me and uh, continued with my interest in art and and music, tried to figure out the piano, etc. But I never learned to play an instrument uh, Mm -hmm. as a kid. The piano was the one that I really wanted to learn. Um, But I always had... So all of these GUI interfaces have been like the, the door opening for you into getting your ideas into a digital format in a super quick and easy way. Yeah, I would, you know, as a kid, I would hear all these ideas in my head and I wouldn't know how to capture them. I kind of knew uh, the music scale a little bit um, from just from what I learned in music class at school, uh, but not well enough to be able to write things down really fast. And Mm -hmm. one day when I was using the computer, I thought to myself, why isn't there an app where I can just drag little blocks around and 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 to to the place like a like a like a automatic piano you know or a music box why can't i just drag little things around um and i'm i'm sure from a from a seasoned musician who understands how to read music or or you know you know uh just play organically that may seem very simple to you but to me it was it would be a dream come true uh and then here comes the iPod Touch, and before that, GarageBand came out, and it did exactly that, and it really excited me. But I wasn't—I worked all day on, on computers, so when I wanted to relax, I didn't necessarily want to be sitting at a computer. Mm-hmm. Um, but these mobile apps were a dream come true, and I and I started writing all kinds of songs um, because these mobile apps made that possible. Made it possible for me to have a different posture, you know, lay down somewhere, or just you know, be on a couch or be in a car. Um, and pin down some musical idea. And then I got on YouTube and I saw all the other amazing stuff that people were doing with the same apps, and they were blowing me away. I mean, they were doing way better stuff than I was. Mm -hmm. Uh, Real talent expressed in digital form. Um, And so, you know, I can understand the argument of, uh, you know, the the argument that you're making reminds me of when computers came out and and people who... uh, were like professional printers or people who um, were uh, professional editors who stitched film together, etc. said, you know, 
I hate these computers because they're going to, you know, they're going to take over our jobs. But mm-hmm. they but they never did. No. They just they just were an entry drug for some people to kind of play. Most people play, but some people who would have never gotten into real professional editing or real professional printing were able to to step into something and made things possible for them to learn something that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to. Um, and either they stayed on a computer, which was fine because computers got better and better, and they, mm-hmm. they now peop, uh, pre-pressmen and graphic designers are creating amazing things on computers, um, as well as as well as editors. Or or they moved on to you know something you know which obviously would still include a computer. Um, but I I think in all cases either um, these these apps are just a, a way for people to express creativity that they haven't had an outlet for mm-hmm. or even better it's a path for them to to find a a you know a real a real talent that they wouldn't have been able to explore before i think that that um that applies to a, a subset of people um i guess uh w- one of my concerns is things like auto-tune for vocals right. and, you know, getting into the fact that um, the interface is more important than the human, the human interface. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and by that, I mean like, um, that's a different, you know, we don't need somebody who can sing well, the computer will fix that. Right. We don't need somebody that can play well, the computer will fix that. Sure. Like when it gets to that, like that level of mentality, and you can kind of hear it in today's popular music, you can sure. hear pitch correction. Right. Uh, when, when there are thick harmonies, you can really hear pitch correction. You can't hear pitch correction in Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Right. You can't hear pitch correction on old Yes albums. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's there's a there's an allure, or, or I mean, it just to get out of the rock world. I mean, you don't hear uh, pitch correction on old barbershop. Well, I um, think what you're crying out for is for is for people to work hard, to become passionate about music, and to really do something amazing. Because mm-hmm. singing into a microphone and having the computer auto tune it, I mean, your idea might be cool, uh, but but what you have accomplished vocally is not amazing. The computer did that for you. Okay? Exactly. And what I'm arguing, what the argument that I'm making is that those people still exist and they don't exist in less number because this technology is out there. It doesn't close the door for people to become great. It opens the door for mediocre people to still have fun. I, and I can see it that way because um, if I think about it more, it kind of opens the conversation up into the use of technology in, um, in mass media. Not mass media as in like the news or anything, but in mass media, in the media that we're talking about, music, um, you know, uh, popular artists using technology to make them sound better than they are. But and so that's a that's a springboard into a different discussion. So the more I think about it, the more it's like, yeah, yeah, the technology could be used for good, but it could be used for evil as well. Yeah, but that, is, that has always <laughs> been the case with with everything, you know. True. You know, I mean, before... and I guess my, my perspective is very much bound in the fact that, you know, I was trained to be a performer and originally recording was meant to capture someone's ability to perform. And then the recording process kind of became its own craft. And now that craft is kind of being besmirched by its ease of accessibility and people being able to very snappily get things together in such a way that took lots of time before. Sure. And, um, and I see how, in one way, that facilitates people's organic ideas, and in another way, it it becomes like a toy. Like, oh, I'm not. Wow, look at me! I'm a musician now. <laughs> Ta-da! Yeah. Well, I can and see I, how I can I can see how I I would think it would be probably more common or less common that people would come to that conclusion just because they could throw loops down. Um, you know, they 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 might really get into it and really have some fun. Uh, but and and I can see some people thinking, well, you know, look how talented I am. I'm as good as this guitarist over here. Um, uh, <laughs> but I would think that that more commonly people would have enough sense to say, you know, this is really fun, and I'm going to produce something really cool with these loops. Uh, but boy, I wish I really, I, I wish I could, I, I wish I could lay these loops down myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and I and oh here's another perspective that that just dawned on me. Um, so have by the you, way, you've you, really you've really upset my 
little brother back there, Matt, when you uh, when you uh, put down auto tune. He loves auto tune. Auto tune can be fun. Yeah. Uh, especially like auto tune the news, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> auto tune the news is a very fun uh, YouTube channel. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, have you ever had the opportunity to like play play gigs live? Like play lots of gigs live? Well, I've 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 sang live. Okay. Uh, again, I don't I don't know how to play an instrument, but but I've um, done live singing. I so here's a perspective from like uh, I've played from gigs where I've been a bass player for like wedding bands to acoustic duos to original you know jazz instrumental things to whatever but i'm going to specify on the acoustic duo scene that i used to be in for a little bit um i think that the way that technology is and karaoke and things are just like blending into each other where you can like make a recording on your on your phone that sounds as good as what you hear on the radio and karaoke machines make you think that you can sing and you have apps that make make you think that you can sing and then you show up to a gig where two people are actually working and you're like dude let me sit in with you uh how do karaoke uh apps make you think you can sing how can karaoke apps make you think that you can sing i think that it's a delusion i think that uh who is it? Randy Jackson, uh, the bass player, producer that was on American Idol. Yeah. I, I was paraphrasing him a little bit when he said, um, the problem with a lot of singers today is that they they kind of have karaoke-itis, um, where they have been to karaoke bars, or they sure. have sang at karaoke, or they own karaoke machines, and it yeah. makes them sound better than they are, and they think that they're better than they are. It doesn't make and, them sound better than they are. It just makes them they they are just the sort of people that hear themselves uh, better than than okay. they really sound. So so you're saying that it facilitates a pre existing delusion? Yeah, I mean most karaoke machines don't have auto tune. So you're so right. However, they sound they sound, and there are lots of people that think well, that they can sing when they can't, and uh, and. Uh, but that that existed well before karaoke. Was uh, just because, I mean, I mean, the the, the thing that uh, the 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 thing that made these people come out uh, was not karaoke machines. Karaoke machines was what let them have fun. What the thing that made them come out of the nooks and crannies was American Idol. And uh, and by the way, American Idol would not have the ratings that it that that it has were it not for those people. So they should be grateful for those people because it is awesome to watch those auditions and to and to and to and to have have them build you up for you know tell this story this this moving story of this person and and how hard they've worked etc and then have this horrendous sound come out of their voice and 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 watch uh simon get all pissed off i mean that is amazing <laughs> to watch and were it not for so, them that wouldn't but, be possible but, but as a as a gigging musician um do i have to put up with every time um you know, somebody gets drunk and they're like, hey, let me sit in. I know the words to that. Or, hey, my brother can sing really well at the karaoke machine. Why don't you let him come up and sing with you? Well, that's or, that, that's your choice. But that dynamic has always been since so I think since since the, the the moment that somebody invented performance music, um, <laughs> that, that, that there's always been somebody, some, you know, uh, uh, unpracticed person that wants to get involved you know, and and uh, in a but sense, I, I guess I'm making a distinction between like um, it rarely happens with the, it rarely happens with the um, older participants or the older crowd members. It's usually the youngsters that are just like, woohoo, American Idol, karaoke. You don't think Let that has a sing. lot to do with maturity, though? It might have something to do with maturity, but I think it also is the environment in which they're brought up, where um, all of these things are blended, where you know. Yeah. Studio quality versus home quality is the same. Yeah. American Idol being on TV, 15 moments of fame, and everyone striving towards it. I mean, now we're getting on tangents. You know, but. we used to have uh, musicians here at the studio uh, for our live audience, and uh, yeah, I can think of uh, uh, two off the top of my head that were, um, in a sense, horrible. Uh, but The musicians uh, themselves? Yes, and 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 we would let them come up on stage and play their songs and in a sense it was it was excruciating um and in another sense it was it was really enjoyable uh and uh you know because there was a, a certain humor to it and also and this is the more important part okay it made them happy 
Um, but that's and, that's a different dynamic. What, what you're well, talking about is is the same um, attitude that I have when I play in the house band at jam nights. Yeah. So when I'm playing a house band at jam nights, I'm expecting yeah. to to be the most gracious person to everybody that comes up because it takes gumption to come to a place where people are expecting somebody else to sing and right. to step into that spotlight and to fulfill that role. And if you do a good job, you're getting a pat on the back. If you do a bad job, you're getting a pat on the back. You know right. what I mean? Right. It's like, I want to reinforce. I want you to come back the next time. I want you to make sure that you had a great time. Even if you thought you did bad, you did well enough that nothing exploded. So we're all better off for it. Right. So you're all in favor of introducing people who can't sing to music and letting them enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You just think that there's a place for that. And that people, because of American Idol and karaoke, people don't understand that place. Yes. The, the people that come to open mic nights are usually of a different ilk than the people that, um, that show up to a gig and kind of push themselves onto the band to perform with them. You know, one, one of them is an appropriate behavior because it's an invitation sure. to come on stage. Sure. And one of them is kind of a, a breach of social contracts where it's like, we're getting paid to perform this function here to entertain you. So why don't you all sit down and be entertained? Okay. So I think it's, I think it's certainly possible that American Idol has, uh, has um, inflamed that condition. Uh, mm -hmm. But in, and as someone who doesn't perform live very often and who doesn't suffer from it, I have to say it's totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what's totally worth it? Let yeah, I, I I love American Idol. I love I love those auditions especially. My my I will watch it's guilty pleasure. You I'll watch, start you watch them I'll start watching American Idol and I will have a ball. And uh and then when they get into the really great performances, I will stop it watching off. it. I'll stop watching it. I wanted to see the hilarious auditions. Mm -hmm. Um and I mean I'll tune in from time to time, but I won't watch it. I won't you know I won't make a point to watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, I love I love the auditions. And so, and so what do you think that says about us? The fact that the, the whole, I mean, cause there is the, the part that you're talking about, the part of American Idol where they talk with the auditions part, yeah. I think is a lot of people's more favorite part than the actual show. Sure. I don't, and, and I, I, don't th consider I think that it's longer pleasure. now than it used to be, isn't it? Maybe. I don't consider it a guilty pleasure though. Should I? Um, I, 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 guess, I guess I would consider it a guilty pleasure because it's. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so over the top. I mean, uh, sometimes they edit it in such a way that it makes it seem like people are showing up just to be hams. And you don't think they are? I think that some people are. I think they yeah. are. I think that some. I think that it, some of the times it looks. Um, I, I love that. Uh, there was the an Oriental gentleman that was on twice. Asian. Yeah, and uh, I can't remember. Um, what his name was, but he was so terrible that he actually sold an album. And I, I, I'm glad I'm, I, I'm cheering him on for that. I didn't buy the album, but the fact that people thought he was so amazingly horrible that they wanted to buy the album to capture that. I mean, something unique about that horribleness. It, didn't um, he sing "She Bangs" by yes, Ricky Martin? Yes, I know exactly. <laughs> that guy was, awesome. and I know exactly who you're talking that about. So, what does awesome. that say about me? I love that guy. Um, this happens all the time in our culture, and I I consider it a positive move forward because because there was a time in in uh, in our in 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 the history of humanity when people like this would be outcasts, and and in a sense they kind of still are, but they are embraced in in a way and loved in a way uh, mm -hmm. that that I don't think has ever been possible before or at least at least much more rare well I, I certainly hope that they're doing it with a grain of salt and they understand that their entertainment value might not be the way that they expect it okay but let's consider three scenarios number okay. one uh three scenarios with with people who cannot sing number one they're <laughs> they're appreciated ironically and they don't realize it okay uh, okay in that situation i believe that that it really doesn't matter. They still they still feel loved, and they are loved. I mean, I, my, I believe they're loved. Secondly, they are, are appreciated ironically, and they know it and embrace it. All positives there. 
And thirdly, they, they are loved ironically, they finally realize it, and they feel bad about it, and either they stop singing, uh, which is a plus, or they practice... <laughs> They practice and they get better, which is also a plus. So, so you're painting all net positives. It sounds. I like. think it's all net positive. Yeah, I think it because is. Because in the first scenario, they're loved. Right. In the second scenario, they accept it and they're loved. Right. Um, and in the third scenario, they get better. Yeah, I mean, or or stop. Who hasn't been? Who who in in this life hasn't been appreciated ironically? And when they when they learn about it, it either teaches them, well, that's really not for me, or uh, you know, I really need to work on this so people will respect me. Which which raises a completely different question. What about people that were just flat out told that they were bad, but kept going anyway? Also admirable, even if they really are bad. Has that ever happened to you? Has it, have you ever had anybody say to your face that you should stop what you're doing? Not not necessarily in singing and and anything that you found yourself good at. To just have somebody be like, yeah, not so much. Yeah, I've had people not appreciate my work. I, I've never had somebody that I highly respect tell me that. Um, but uh, I guess I'm fortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've, Our I've time's almost up here. We've got about four okay. minutes left at most, but I, I like to end the shows at 45 because that's technically the length. And, and nobody respects me as a producer when I say that the shows are 45 minutes. And, uh, and so I have to make I a do point. My best. Yeah, well, you just do started. I know you gotta whip me into shape. Yeah, even Bob Bob Graves even says on Facebook, "My show's about fifty minutes," uh, and so yeah, I get no respect. Well, I, I will do my best to respect you, Joey. Thank I you. didn't realize that it was. Thank you. It's I really, didn't realize that you got so little. Yeah, it's really bad. It's really bad. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, well I, I I really enjoyed this, and uh, and we and and uh, one of these days uh, I will. Um, I mean, the, the purpose of Clash Course is not for Greg and I to argue all the time. It's for people to come and take our places. And mm -hmm. so one of these days, I'm going to invite you back on the show, and we're going to have a talk about, uh, about uh, the origin of the universe, um, which was the, a backup topic that we had in mind, but this, this was too fun. Um, mm -hmm. But I, th I think it'll be an interesting discussion between you and I. Sounds um, good. Okay, well, uh, coming up in just a moment, uh, uh, Mowdy Man himself or mom, as we sometimes call him, or at least I do, <laughs> um, is going to be uh, filling in for Greg Bray on Inspiring Honesty. That's coming up in just a few minutes, so stick with us.